Okay, that should be recording. Okay, men, I'm delighted to announce my next guest today in the second of my interviews with some truly inspiring people. And these are people that have dealt with adversity and great challenges in their own life to, I like to think, help us best prepare for the challenges we are facing at the moment. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, present to you John Clark. And I'm not going to actually say too much about him because I want him to tell you for yourself what he's all about. So, John, actually, I do want to hand over the introduction to you because okay. you can best describe yourself in a nutshell. And then I know we'll get on to it as we talk, my man. Okay, well, well first of all, Tiaz. Great to, great to actually get on and get this recording for actually facilitate. But uh, oh, brilliant! Thanks for having me on. And uh, just to introduce myself, I'm John Clark. I am the CEO of Rehabilitate Youth Ireland, which is a youth distraction charity that was set up in Northern Ireland in uh, 2015. Um, I myself, a wee bit of just a basic about myself here. I grew up in Belfast here from 1975. I was born in uh, North Belfast, Ardoin probably one of the hardest uh, impacted communities in the Troubles um, you know, over the last 30 years. So growing up in Belfast here, you know, I started off as a young child here, growing up here in and, 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 and at the drive. And, uh, and the, the basis of that the drive here was a very, very, very active street here during the hunger strike period of time. And uh, the, the, the times here that followed on from the late 70s, the early 80s and stuff. A lot of stuff happened outside my door, right in front of my eyes. And uh, growing up, maybe around about six, seven years, up to the 10 years of age, I was very much excited about what was going on, you know, in the community. And maybe that's what, that's what you did see, you know. And it was a lot different back then here than what it is now. You know, we've we seen British soldiers as a rule on the street. You know, you opened your front door, you've seen a British soldier in your garden. You've seen a British soldier hidden behind a lamppost or passing patrols, whatever else. And you also seen the Republican end of things, you know, so that you'd have seen the, 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 the local activists and the IRA volunteers engaging the police. You know, it was a very, very hard time growing up. But as I say, as a young, as a young boy, it was also very exciting. So, you know, that has a double-edged sword to it. Where it myself, it excited me to the point where, you know, I, I wanted to be involved and stuff like that here and you know it was, it was not so much that it was glorified it was never glorified in my own home but it was certainly glorified in the streets you know by your local people and your peers back then there was no nobody wanted to progress you on to what what you wanted to be in life or whatever else here we, we were just very very much fixated on what was going on on the streets there and then so you know People didn't really give much of a thought about what they wanted to be or where they wanted to be, you know, in 20 years' time. And yeah. I think maybe most people here today, <laughs> that other people been have been around, uh, maybe, maybe ended up in jail or some, some of them end up in, in the grave, which is a wee bit worse, you know. But you know, effectively, it, it was a hard time growing up, but it was a time that you know, that shaped me as a, a, as a character and then it stood by me by the rest, before the actually rest of my life, you know, the things that I had been involved in from then, the now has made me an, a, a definitely, definitely a different person, a stronger person, you know, and, and, and some, I have a good, a good uh, view or overview of what has happened, when it has happened and how it has happened. And that's not because I've been trained or taught or, or told how, to think that's from my own experiences, you know, of what's what's been lacking, what's been present, and what and, and, and what's you know what's the future to come, and you know, and in, in my community, you know, it's, it's a lot, a lot of a lot of large numbers of children, you know. So as we were growing up, by thirty, I think it was about thirty-five of us, all cousins, first cousins, you know. So we had a great, great childhood. Excellent childhood, you know, when you were out playing, playing in the street, you played rapid doors and, you know, you jump sticks and shoot the rabbit and stuff like that. You know, it's things that you don't ever, ever see, you know, communities completely change now. Everything's changed. Like the whole, the, the generations of people have changed. So, and based on that, you know, I grew up through the, the, 
the, the bad days here, well, we have very dark days, but uh, I found myself 1987, which <laughs> when you think about it now, it's <laughs> showing our age. But in 1987, I joined the junior wing in the Irish Republican Army here in uh, in Belfast. And I was a very, very active young man, even though it was probably too young to be being maybe where I was. I, I, I certainly didn't lack in any way uh, inspiration or you know, my, on my activity level. So I got caught up in that sort of the hard lane of things. And... I was involved in a lot of stuff there between the ages of 12 and 14 that maybe a 12 or 14 year old should never have seen or, ne- or never done. You know, and maybe sometimes when you actually think back about it now, you know, I still find it a wee bit incredulous that, <laughs> you know, Jesus Christ, did you actually do that? Did, were you actually involved in that? And, and right now, at this present moment in time, if I was to discuss what I actually done at the ages of, or what I was in, involved in, in large numbers and the age of between 12 and 14, you know, that we could lock me up for a long time now on an adult level. But as I said, it had a great impact on me. I'd never ever felt cheated out of my life because he enjoyed where I was. Yes. And I always enjoyed what I'd done. And, and when the uh, social level of it here, everybody was very friendly, everybody knew each other, communities were a bit tighter. You know, so it had its good points and its bad points. And everybody knew somebody had died. You know, with all family members and all have been involved and stuff. But as I say, you know, it's it was something that it was set out for us. We never had no choice in that. You know, we were growing into it, born into it, and as I say, we 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 we, <laughs> we just lived it. The us, it was just commonplace. So we just get on with it. John, I remember if um, you shared with me. <clears throat> before when we spoke, I'd love you to just tell the audience there was a lovely time when you were telling me about an incident that occurred and maybe because of it or in spite of it, your mother never let you play with a certain thing and there was, I found that quite interesting. Could you share that again? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Well, people probably get a, a, a kick out of it now here because from, from I was a child till, till I was never, ever, ever allowed a toy gun. <laughs> never allowed a toy gun. I've never seen a toy gun here in, in my household. I had five brothers, or four, well, four brothers, five of us. And, you know, we, we, we played caps and rubbers with sticks. <laughs> it was really bad. But I can understand my mother's point of view from it. Maybe back then you didn't understand it, but certainly now. I can remember on loads of occasions, you know, sitting at home and uh, you know, maybe late at night and the doors getting kicked in and maybe a, a British army and a, a, a police search getting done in the house. And on one of these occasions here, and it was just before I was born, but the, the army and entered my mother's house and at my drive. It's actually subject now to uh, a book, and they give interviews or for a book that was written out on the untold truths uh, a few years back there about murders that had happened in the communities that the thing. But one of these shootings actually actually took place from, from my mother's bedroom. And uh, it was the time that the army broke into the house and uh, there was people engaged in the street. There was somebody in the street standing holding a, a cup of tea and they shot him dead. So anything in the hand <laughs> that didn't look normal or looked like it could have been perceived as a as a weapon of sorts, and that 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 was a big big factor, you know. And the, the, that guy was called Michael McClarney, was one of my daddy's best friends growing up, and when Michael was murdered, but uh, we uh, this, that does him. We never had a toy gun, never ever, you know. <laughs> but seems we stupid things then I when we think we do stupid things, but you know, massive massive things back then. A massive thing to look at. Thank you for sharing that, John. And I was very interested how it went from that within the home, certainly, that very strict tolerance, certainly from your parents, about even play acting with weapons, even though, as you say, it was outside, even inside your home previously. Uh, can you, to the best of your ability, are you able to talk about the progression from? that sort of strictness within the home to now going out and the type of role models that were doing what they were doing, John? Well, the role models on my street then were, were, were Act the Fire, Amen. That was the, 
that was a balaclava and a gun. It was a, you know, I don't know how many times I had to have my, you, you find yourself, if you grew up in something, you find yourself desensitized. Well, maybe you don't realize that you're desensitized to it because you're growing up and, and you're experiencing it at first hand. So you change your opinions every day. And you look at your role models around you, the mother and father that had been the, massively you know affected here through the, 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 the whole troubles and stuff but never ever ever one day in their lives spoke a bad bad uh never never spoke a bad word i never heard any pro-republican conversations i never heard anything to, to encourage us in where we're where we we were you know destined to, destined to become uh you know but the street the street well, the street was a lot different. The street here, it was everybody knew in IRA, man. Everybody, everybody was here, although people didn't talk about it. We knew who was doing the shootings on the street, and then we we were very, I was very excited all about that. Now, as I say, I had a couple of other brothers that weren't excited about it, but certainly, and they, they, they're excited. I know, we, I know we've spoken about this before, but I often find it fascinating, and this is why I'd like you to speak on it, because you have, we we'll move on to it, but you, you certainly hang around with a type of group. You now hang around with a slightly di different circle. Anyway, we'll get on to it. My point being is I often talk about the importance of who you associate with. Can you speak a, a little bit more in your direct experience of the power of who you surround yourself with? Well, when I, when I went, in, in respect to what, what I was doing back then, and the directions that I ended up in here, the people that I was certainly involved with were in part, they, they were the part, they were uh, the active guys on the street. So, you know, I remember starting, I remember getting into uh, the first year in school, I had a fry fry, uh, what would you say? Well, I don't want to sound too big headed or anything, but I had a lot of, a lot of pull. You know, I was already a well-connected character, first year, second year in school. Some people in my own communities now wouldn't, maybe wouldn't even believe me <laughs> because a lot of them maybe didn't even see these kind of the, the, the elements here. Everybody goes up in different directions, but I was very much I was very much involved with a, with the, the, the provisional IRA at that age here, and I had a very very I had a very, I had a lot of power back then here on the ground. I had a lot of and the, the people that I was with were the part they they were the be all and end all, and you know that. <clears throat> different strokes with different folks and that's that that's the way i ended up a lot of people ended up here doing doing other things and, and but myself that's that that's the distraction but i enjoyed the the excitement and the the, the adventure and the stuff that that it offered and i think to be honest with you if, if, if i would be truthfully honest with myself if i had been a protestant i'd have been a british soldier <laughs> you know that's that's a fact so it was just but then. to say that many of us as, as, as young men in particular, but we seek very earnestly for a cause. And it's almost potluck there, I so say, which cause gets us first, whether that's a powerful teacher and guides us maybe to university or the very street or maybe more violent endeavours. What, what do you think, John? Well, a hundred, and it's absolutely that. That's a an absolute fact, but it's it's it still has it. Ireland is a very confusing place, even for now, because your role models now in your government were the people who sent us on the street to create violence, and that's a fact. You know, I stand there here with the Jerry Kellys and the people here project progress themselves on the television here as peacekeepers, peacemakers. I remember Jerry Kelly standing addressing crowds of rioters in Belfast. And encouraging them to go out and can to conduct acts of terrorism here and get involved in stuff like that. There. So I've seen our nine leaders and our, as you call them, our, our inspirational uh, people weren't that inspirational back then. So go back to when we were born and we're back to when we were young. They, they didn't want a normal society back then. They wanted soldiers. They wanted. You know, our communities were born out of, were, were, were filled with micro groups and organizations here, whether it be a Protestant state or, or the Catholic state. But these people needed bodies on the street. They needed people in the ground. So we were indoctrinated. You know, you walked out your street 
on your way down to school, you have your mother helpers. My mother took five of us down to school every morning from primary school. And every wall that you passed, there was a painting of an IRA man with a machine gun, a rocket launcher, or shooting over a coffin or something, something that glorified, something that glorified the cause, you know? So the, that was it. There was only one cause then. There was nothing else. So you were in Dr. and then the one said, or you stayed at home and you didn't get involved. That was no, there was no in between. There was, there was Republicanism or there was nothing, you know? And that, that's, when I say nothing, I mean just getting on with your, some people did just get on with their normal legs and, and put the blinkers on. But for people here, everybody has a different, a different mechanism. In life, and something has, that excites me might not excite you, McNeil. Well, actually, may excite you, but <laughs> it certainly doesn't excite a lot of other people. And some people think that we're mad in the actions that we do, but they wanted soldiers when we were young, and that's what they directed to you, you know. So, it's I'd like to um, thank you for sharing that. I'd like you to talk a bit about where life has actually brought you today, actually, because I know there's a a huge amount in deep years were of the middle ground. But are you happy to talk about a little bit where life has brought you today to offer just a bit of contrast? Certainly, yeah. Well, go on, come, coming out of what I, what I came out of, I firm myself on that, what I came out of. My, my life went from 12 years of age till present day. Well, when I say present day, we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll say 2014, right? Because I think maybe 2014 was my last period in jail. Uh, 2014, uh, between 2000, or 1987 and 2014, it was a roller coaster for me. So I had been in and out and in and out of Republicanism from, from the end to sort of what people would have thought. My, my life changed from I was either in jail for Republican stuff or I was in jail for uh, like the armed robberies or stuff. There was no middle ground in me. I was a straight core, hardcore kid from the train me from I was a young buck. And what I what I done, what I done, but I, I was in that slippery. Yeah, I'm gonna say I was on that roller coaster system for for quite a few years. Progressing over the um, years, I get a good sense. I get a good. I have a good eye eye for for community. I have a good eye to see what 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 happens and what doesn't happen. And again, I know growing up, what what was able to how people were able to engage me and, and what people did for engagement was very very simple things. And it was a simple thing like stopping and talking to you in the street, you know, or maybe just giving you five minutes at a time just to, to humanize you, you know. So growing up in that, I related to certain individuals and I still relate to them. And I had a couple of fantastic mentors. I know that in a sense here has a bad, bad world and we were engaged in doing bad, bad things. But I was shaped by a couple of five, very influential older men that give me a lot of uh, a lot of uh, inspiration for myself but also a lot of maybe encouragement for for the future you know that there was alternative everybody was all we were always looking at an alternative you know my community was no we, we don't do police even now that this day you know police is a bad it is a, an issue that a lot of people wouldn't you know if something happens people don't phone the police it's very very even today even, even even to even today, it has a it, it's a taboo, you know, where people would, would, would phone the police. So the communities now still have that sort of between a rock and a hard place. But growing up, I've been shot three times. I've been, I've, I've found myself on I've been on the good side of these guys, and I've been on the bad side of these guys. I've lived my life, and, and I've I've done some stuff wrong. I've put my step my foot out of step. And I've had punishment for it. I've been locked up in jail by the police, numbers of occasions. I've been shot by paramilitaries on on other occasions. Paramilitaries don't have jails. They don't have the, the abilities to, you know, incarcerate them, whatever else. So in our communities, most people get shot. Very few people went to jail. Most people get shot. So like people like myself, who's been on both sides, both sides of that fence. And I have to be very careful about what I, what I say and how I say it because I don't want to be put. I like to be inspirational, but I don't want to be putting people in the, put myself in any positions. But I, I myself 
my, myself and a couple of others here got together in maybe late 2014 and started looking for a different sort of alternative as to where we were going and how we were, how we were going to achieve what we wanted. So what we wanted to do was we were finding large groups of, kids, of young people had started now. It was baby boom. <laughs> it was baby boom coming in the two thousand. Sure, and what we, when everybody was distracted with the uh, the peace processes and everything else, these kids were all growing up, and people were missing them, you know, and they were overlooking them until they started congregating in crowds of fifty, sixties, and hundreds, you know, at a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. Then it became quite problematic for a lot of people. Some people just don't even like to see kids hanging about, you know, and some people, you know, the the, the old uh, Victor Meldry type of people. <laughs> See the show on our age now, isn't it, Victor Meldry? <laughs> to use him as a reference. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a group of people got together and said there has to be a way, there has to be a way that we can engage these people. And looking back to what way some people in the fit and got to me was by just, just that simple giving somebody five minutes of their time and making them feel as if they're connected in some way. So what our problems is now our kids are disenfranchised. They don't look at me, they, they do not look at our communities here as, a, as inspirational in any way. You look at somewhere here, they look, they, all the young people want to do is grow up. They don't want to hang about, they're not doing what we were doing. By God, they're not doing, thank God they're not doing what we were doing. They're not seeing what we were doing. And they're not going to be living or, or, or dealing with it 44 years later, a year with the after effects of what they did here 30 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. <laughs> but it's, we, we come up with a way that we, we would, we would engage with them. So that's exactly what we did, you know, instead of being an authoritarian here with you, the, the way that the rest of the community or the rest of the community was dealing with them, we decided here to enough enough and talk to them directly. So we did, we engaged about 200 of them from one community and we basically rewrote history in, in, in North Belfast in the sense where, you know, the kids in the North Belfast now relate to us and to this day, you know, would engage me quite regular in what's going on, especially right now at this present moment in time when you've got all this stuff going on with the conspiracy of the 5G, the coronavirus and everything. Kids are looking to us for a bit of direction, a bit of a, you know, a bit of a thing. I think they're very, very cool, you know, that they're actually coming to the likes of us now and looking for some kind of a, you know, what's going on here, or, you know, the kids are very switched on as well. Great generation of young lads, but they just need that. They just need the, um, they just need to, uh, just, just somebody coming in the front of the house. Uh, they, they just need to, 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 to reconnect with them and, and just, Direct them in the same, direct them, and send them it, just direct them in the uh, in the way that, that we want them to go now. Not the way, the way we want them to go, but just the way that life should be going in, in general. We, we know circumstances have changed. What are some of the problems in, as you say, the problem may have not disappeared, but it may have shifted. So if they're not getting involved in the actual hands on violence that you and your associates had to become involved in, what are some of the challenges they are facing or are engaged in? Well, basically, the challenges that we see with the young people now, so there's not enough there to engage them. You know, they're, they're corner kickers. So the, when, when they say, you, you get massive amounts of uh, young people gathering about corners, and when, now that we engage them here and started discussing with them, we found a lot of different reasons as to why they're on corners, all different. You know, so a lot of the ones here that when we engage them here, all do have background hobbies that they maybe grew up in. So whether it was starting off here from a boxing point of view, you know, or they were, they were involved in football or different types of sports, you know, growing up. But for whatever reasons, we're not able to carry them out for, for the, the rest of their, their lives. Very, far expensive, some of these sports and stuff here and the communities that we come from are... You know, they're borderline, borderline poverty. And for what well, we found that there was a lot of people there that weren't able. If you opened the best boxing gym in the world, if you were charging kids to come into it, there wouldn't, some of these kids wouldn't be able to go. So you were start football academies. You get to you start football academies that are coming out of, you know, coming out of your ears. And so you're charging people to get involved in it. 
a lot of people can't go. So we were looking at that, but that in itself here, that the actual financial end of things here was a big, big factor as to why some people couldn't exist or some couldn't get involved or get themselves away from the corners. There's nothing to do, no finance to do it. You know, in the back end and the families, maybe not, maybe the families just haven't got the abilities to, to support them in the way that they do. So there was a lot of different issues here that, that mulled in the one, you yes. know, that that we sort of uh, came together. And, and what what I sort of, what we were looking at to do was, if, if I was to be able to, what I actually engaged in once, it was just, if I'm, I'm a realist, if I'm able to get you a gym that you're able to go to every day for the rest of your life and train for free, would you go? He says, of course I would. He says, well, if you were going to go to a boxing gym, and I was able to get you to go to a boxing gym and not charge you, would you go? And he says, yes. And he says, the young lads who are racing their motorbikes and their mopeds, you know, and this is all part of the same crowd. He says, what can I do to get you your motorbike parked up? You know, and stop using this community as a racing track. You know, so what we come up with, he says, if I was to get you a racing track, if I was to, to engage with people to get you a, a racing program, we'd just park your bikes up. And they all said, yeah. And so we started on a basis of that, that we, I went out of my way, along with, with some of my friends, and we found a 48,000 square foot building that was up in North Belfast Land Abbey for 30 years. And being builders ourselves, we decided to maybe take it on. So we decided we needed a charity to be able to do this here because the rates issue would have been a, bit of a massive thing. So charities don't pay rates. Um, so we moved in, we set ourselves up as a charity. And even the name for the charity that they're coming about here because we looked at every aspect of the youth, whether it's coming from our background or, or the, the, just the kid here who just wants to play football and doesn't and, and wants to chase wee girls on a Friday, Saturday night, but doesn't want to be chased away from every street corner that he, that he congregates on. You know, we 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 uh, we were able to to come up with a pretty pretty good couple of pretty good uh, programs and projects and a very 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 unique way of getting the, the, them the free, the ability to do stuff for free. So what I done was engaged, um, we created up the name for the charity. We had to, what we decided to do was you had to rehabilitate the youth, okay? So you can't just take a youth from the, the, the corner, you can't take a kid's motorbike and hand them a tennis racket and say, here, you're playing tennis now because that motorbike's annoying everybody, that child's a razor. So why not take it and embrace it? Why not try and find your next major mansell or your next, you know, you know, uh, oh, Jesus, motorbike racers, I'm not even too sure, but, you know, why not find your next star? They're there, you know, and you're, you're discouraging them. So we decided to embrace it. So rehabilitate youth was what we decided that we needed to do. You need to take them right from the, the bring them back to basics and rehabilitate them, re-engage them, deal with them, make them more human, talk to you, let them talk, let them talk to you, talk to them and engaged and just inspire them to just to create just that new connection with people and that's that's exactly what we've done so rehabilitate you was formed in 2015 and as i said we found we went down and sourced we had four projects here that we wanted to kick off the four projects being was sport and, uh, sport and fitness um parkour i don't know have you ever heard of a, a, a thing called parkour have you right well, we started off here. We actually were lucky enough to have the very first parkour gym ever in, in, in the whole of the UK, right? And it was a guy called Paul Allen who does the Ninja Warrior program. Paul sets the whole Ninja Warrior program. He actually was uh, a runner-up contestant on it there last year. But we, we, we started that off. So I actually have some, some quite unique videos and stuff here from, from the building. And we'll, we'll show you as we build it up. But what I've done was we, we created a bartering program. So I went to the, I went to my friends in uh, Olympus Gym, Michael Opie, and I says, Michael, I says, if I was to move, you know, to at your, if I was to give you a new gym in a, in a f massive, massive building with other businesses based around you, enveloped around you, and you know, would you take it? He says, of course I would. You know, in business sense here, food fall would be fa absolutely fantastic. He says, that's great. I says, I want you to give out free programs to the kids. Would you be involved in? He says, certainly. He says, brilliant. I would be, I'd be more than happy with that. He says, but uh, you know, 
there's only so much here that we can do on a free level, you know, if people are running business. So what I actually decided to do was that Michael Obi would have been one of the main characters that would have been using uh, white color boxing. Well, he would have been organizing white color boxing and stuff here as a fundraising activity for charities. So we decided right from the very start, we had maybe the, the first breakdown in Stormont way back in 2014 or 2015 and around about that time anyway. And charities and everything were going to the wall because the funding wasn't being released and everything else. So we decided starting off from that stage, never to start off our program or our project based on government funding. Because the way that they've reacted and the way that the the, you know, the, the way that they have projected themselves here now that, that it hasn't helped in any way, shape or form that any charity or homeless charities now, homeless <laughs> if you remember we see now what's going on at the minute. You know, they, they can't even work together, they can't they can't release monies at the right time and they use their monetary values as, as a they, they use their funding as as I mean, mechanisms here to correct or move or steer your program, whatever way to, to mold it into their own sorts of ways. So we decided that we are never going to do it on government funding and we were do it through our own medium. Uh, our biggest, our biggest uh, ambition would be to create a Northern, uh, create an Ireland here with with no compass points in it, <laughs> where nobody defines themselves as being from a certain Pacific point, you know, and everybody decides to be, to be you know, just a one one person or one one character. And what we decided to do then was music would have been a, a big way here to to bring people together secretly. So we had decided that we're never ever going to make a big issue. We we're never going to project ourselves as a cross community uh, narrative. We were never going to go out there and deliberately, you know, go on the the, the, the campaign for we're a cross community group. We we're just going to be a cross community, a secret cross community group that was just going to ignore <laughs> ignore what we had been indoctrinated in because that's what happens. We were indoctrinated in this stuff, and we're not going to pass that on. So we created the the the, uh, the project where we. We would just do things quietly. We would organize a concert here or two that would maybe would fund, create funding for ourselves, but also would allow us to put maybe four or five thousand, maybe maybe anything. The, the, the numbers are, are, you know, the sky's the limit here, depending on where you are. But uh, we would be able to bring two or three thousand people together and without them even noticing. <laughs> you know, it would have been a good mingle them. Through different mediums, whether it's through music, sports, you know, find a common denominator, you know, whatever, whatever that person likes, whether it's, uh, it's football matches or whether it's boxing matches, uh, mixed martial arts, or we decided that we were going to put these shows in place for people. And by doing that, everybody having a common denominator, that, or a common medium that would all be able to engage no matter where they're from or what they're from they all there they're all sports fans they're all music fans they're all there to watch their local DJ the, the, the catch ups and the hang ups of the past is all forgot about because nobody, nobody's highlighting them so I've been lucky enough to be connected to a massive, massive people in the music industry and I think it's maybe a law of attraction thing I don't know some people believe it some people don't I certainly do. Okay, I have to say it here that we wanted to do music and uh, sporting events as our main fundraising, and the people that I've been deliberately brought in connection with here are the biggest, biggest names in the industry straight across the board. We've set up several companies now here to self fund ourselves. The charity has set up three, four companies now where we self fund ourselves through programs. And we're just really launching, reinventing ourselves this year, and relaunching ourselves. Where you're, I'm recording from now, is our, our one of our new project uh, spots here, where we're putting it. This is now our new offices. It's also my new home, but it's also our new offices. And in, in the future here, we have a, a a hotel facility going on the on this site here for disability uh, training facility or for a training facility for hospitality. For disability youth and people with uh, learning difficulties, <laughs> you nearly see it myself. <laughs> John, can we can we continue this because I'm just aware we're coming to the end of our time on this okay. talk. So I'm just going to stop it there, and so we can go into the next one. But thank you very much indeed for your time no that you've so far, John. Just allow me to stop recording. But thank no you.